How do you analyze a negligence issue on a tort essay question? Well, remember in our last video, we said your analysis was gonna be centered on four elements, duty, breach, causation, and damages. And we started our discussion of the first element, which is duty. And we went through Paul's graph to determine how you would determine on a tort essay question whether or not the defendant owed the plaintiff a duty of care. In this video, we want to focus on once you establish that the defendant did owe the plaintiff a duty of care. If so, what level of care was owed? What is the level of care that the defendant owed the plaintiff? We call this the standard of care. What standard of care did the defendant owe the plaintiff? And when, I, when you think about standard of care, I want you to envision a spectrum, right? Imagine that this is your spectrum of care. We have different levels of care on this spectrum that could be owed to the plaintiff. And at the top or the high end of the spectrum, the highest levels of care might be someone like a physician, right? Physicians go through 10 to 15 years of advanced training and education. They're obviously very intelligent, very educated, very trained, and they deal with patients and they have lives in their hands every day. So because of the amount of education and training and the stakes of what are involved in the medical profession where you may have patients' lives in your hand, we want to hold physicians to a very high level of care, right? When we're doing an analysis that involves a physician as the defendant, we're going to hold them to a very high standard of care. Now on the other hand, at the bottom of this spectrum, you might have something like children, children engaged in non-adult activities. Imagine that a child chases a ball into the street, which results in some type of car accident, right? In that situation, we might say, say it's a five-year-old child. We might want to hold that five-year-old child to a lower standard of care than an adult in the same situation. An adult chasing a ball into the street, we might say is a different situation than a five-year-old child chasing a ball into the street. So in that situation, a child might be at a little bit lower of a standard of care owed to the plaintiff if the child is a defendant, which of course, remember often too, this gets confused. A child can be held liable for negligence, right? So in the middle of this spectrum, we have the reasonable person standard of care. This is your default standard of care. And this is what's going to be applied in most instances. The only time actually that you're not applying the reasonable person standard of care, which is in the middle of this spectrum, is going to be if the defendant falls into a certain class, like a physician or a child. And there's several others. I can list them below this video in the description if you want to learn more about that or if you have a statute that is defining a standard of care as a matter of law. We call that negligence per se. So if you don't have a statute or a special class of defendant, you're going to be applying the reasonable person standard of care. So what is the reasonable person standard of care? All the reasonable person standard asks you to do is ask yourself what a reasonably prudent person of ordinary sensibilities would have done under the circumstances, under similar or like circumstances, as measured by an objective standard. And the key to the reasonable person standard analysis is all going to be about this idea of objective standard. Right, this is the key to understanding the reasonable person standard of care. It's measured by an objective standard. So you're asking yourself, what would a reasonably prudent person have done under these circumstances as measured by an objective standard? So the first thing that you have to realize when we're thinking about an objective standard is the difference between objectivity and subjectivity. We do not care how well-intentioned this defendant may have been. We do not care how much good faith this defendant exercised. 
That is all subjectivity. We don't care about what the defendant honestly believed in their heart, what their intentions were. All of that stuff has no place in a reasonable person standard of care analysis. All we're asking is what would a reasonably prudent person have done in the situation? Not what did this defendant think or what were this defendant's intentions? All of that stuff will get you tons of markups on your tort's essay. It's all wrong and I see that mistake made all the time and tort essay graders, tort professors or bar examiners are going to know this and they're going to include things oftentimes that make the defendant look like a good person, you know, so to speak. And that is to basically trick you, for lack of a better word, because we don't care about the subjective intent of the defendant in a reasonable person standard of care analysis. It's all about objectivity. So what are some examples of this? Probably the biggest example of this where this idea of objectivity is most illustrated is when the defendant has mental, mental or emotional disabilities. If the defendant has a mental or emotional disability, is that allowed to be you know, thought about, is that allowed to be a part of the analysis and the reasonable person standard of care? And the answer is no. The defendant is going to be held to a standard of somebody of average intelligence, of ordinary sensibilities. We don't care about any mental or emotional disabilities that the defendant might have. That defendant is still going to be held to the standard of care of an average person of ordinary sensibility. So you can't argue if you're the defendant, hey, maybe I should have a little bit lower of a threshold, a little bit lower of a level of care. Oh, because I have some sort of mental or emotional disability, court's not going to allow that. That falls too, that's too subjective. It's not objective enough under the reasonable person standard of care. Now, on the other hand, the only caveat to this whole objective standard idea is physical disabilities. If you're dealing with a defendant who is blind or deaf or paralyzed from the waist down, anything that would be considered a physical disability, that is going to be able to be included in the reasonable person standard of care analysis. So the question then would become, what would a reasonably prudent blind person have done in this situation as measured by an objective standard? Or what would a reasonably prudent person who is paralyzed from the waist down have done in this situation as measured by the objective standard, right? It's still an objective test, but we are going to ask, we're able to include that physical disability in the analysis. Mental and emotional disabilities, that is completely discarded. That cannot be included. Remember, for mental and emotional conditions, we're still gonna hold that defendant to the standard of care that a person of average intelligence and ordinary sensibilities would be held to. So that's gonna be your main thing you wanna look out for in a reasonable person standard of care analysis. Sometimes it helps too with my students. I'd say to think about an avatar in your head for a responsible defendant. You know, you can think of this as maybe a movie character or a TV character or someone you know in your life who is very responsible, um, always exercises precautions when you know doing activities, avoid to avoid harming others or to, or to avoid creating risk of harm to others. Sometimes it can help to just have this idea of a responsible person in your head and you can kind of plug that avatar into the analysis as you're thinking about the fact pattern in your head. You know, what would this person have done in this situation and what would this responsible person have done under these circumstances and that's kind of going to be your analysis you know so to give one example before i sign off here imagine that we have um, a car driving down the street say it's some big shot attorney he's obviously very busy he's trying to answer all of his emails while driving his car he pulls out his laptop to send an email as he's typing on his laptop and driving he injures a pedestrian crossing the street. The question is, would a reasonably prudent person have pulled out their laptop while operating a car to send an email? And in that case, the answer is obviously going to be no. So we're probably going to have a breach of the duty of care. Oh, if we're applying a reasonable person standard of care, 
we're probably going to find that the defendant owes a plaintiff a duty in that situation as a person driving a car either under the Cardozo opinion zone of foreseeable danger a plaintiff is going to be or a pedestrian is going to be within the zone of foreseeable danger Andrews it's going to come to the same thing it doesn't matter a duty is going to be owed by a driver to pedestrians no matter what way you slice it so the first part of the duty analysis would be easy there if so what level of care is owed reasonable person standard of care as long as we're not dealing with some specific class of defendant which we might be but in this case let's just assume that we're not it's a reasonable person standard of care so you apply that you're going to ask yourself, would a driver, a reasonably prudent person have done this under the situation? Would a reasonably prudent person pull out their laptop and send an email while driving? Probably not. So that's probably going to be a breach of the level of care that was owed, a breach of the standard of care that was owed. So all that would be left to show is causation and damages and that negligence analysis is over, okay? But we'll do way more examples, way more in depth, way more tricky, but just to give you an idea of how the reasonable person standard plays out. But with that, guys, in our next video, we'll talk about some of the other classes of defendants that can change this reasonable person standard. Because remember, this is just your default standard of care. It can be raised for people like physicians and it can be lowered possibly for children as well. So we do want to think about some other classes of defendants. Also, we're going to want to talk about the possibility if you're dealing with a statute that defines a standard of care as a matter of law, which we call negligence per se. So we'll still have some things to wrap up here on the standard of care, but this is your default analysis under the reasonable person standard, okay? With that, guys, we'll get into it in our next videos. But until then, I wish you all the absolute best, and I'll see you at our next video.